So the second topic we have, new trends in the management of inflammation. Uh, may I request Dr. M. S. Ramakrishnan to uh, enlighten us with this uh, topic. So uh, he is presently Vice President, Biologics Drug Development, Biocon Research Center based in Bangalore. He has done his PhD in Biochemistry from the University of Mysore in 1995 and conducted postdoctoral research for two years, 1997 to 99, in Howard Hughes Medical Institute, University of Chicago. So although his initial uh, research was in East Biochemistry, since 2005 he has focused more on process and drug development pathways for novel and biosimilar monoclonal antibodies. So he has been technical lead for the development of uh, Italizumab, which is anti CD6 monoclonal antibody, which has been uh, DCJ approved now for severe plaque psoriasis in 2000, since 2013. He's also been part of the team which developed biosimilar tastrosuban, as you all know, is used to treat, uh, um, it's a monoclonal antibody used to treat estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, and for which it was FDA approval granted in December last year. So some of his core competencies are in the technical leadership for drug development projects uh, in the areas of oncology and autoimmune diseases and also uh, uh, establishing analytical similarity so of biosimilar monoclonal antibodies and also its immunogenicity. Over to you sir. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Chandrasekhar. Thank you to the organizers of this symposium to give me a chance to speak here. I am not going to speak anything about what we have done in Biocon. This is going to be like an kind of overview. Dr. Chandrasekhar asked me to kind of present what are the possible new drugs that are coming into existence in management of inflammation. Uh, so keeping in mind the debate Dr. Chandrasekhar and Dr. Ramar Mishra had, it looks as though when you see this, when you go through these slides, which is essentially an overview and a survey of what is really happening around the world with respect to development of new drugs, it indicates that Possibly, we need to have a different kind of an approach to start treating these kind of diseases because there are too many failures happening with respect to uh, the targets get validated but the drugs don't work in the clinic. The other point here is this that uh, there are three inflammatory disorders which I am not going to focus because there are no interesting new drugs which are coming up. Uh, one is definitely SME, the other one is type 1 diabetes and also I am not focusing on multiple sclerosis and also uveitis because there are some new targets coming up but I don't have the time to discuss all of them. What I am going to focus essentially is are there any drugs getting into development which is beyond the Th1 and Th17 pathways and the GNS kinases which I think so everybody, every clinician knows about it and that's what I am going to move forward and start discussing. But before that and for each of the inflammatory diseases, I am going to kind of give an overview of what is known and what is being developed as slides which will be forthcoming in the slide deck. So what, are, what, are, what is the status summary with respect to drugs used for treating inflammation, in this case rheumatoid arthritis. As you see here, uh, you have got a set of biologics which are all, um, which are all marketed or in phase 3 clinical trial or phase 2 clinical trial, but you have a host of drugs which is targeting the TH17 pathway which have been discontinued. Surprisingly, there is some kind of a asymmetry in understanding the science with respect to how the TH17 pathway works in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, but just simply doesn't work in rheumatoid arthritis. And that's the case also which I'm not going to discuss is that many of these TH17 pathway drugs don't work in multiple sclerosis, even though they are being tried and evaluated in different clinical trials. So what is very interesting is this, that uh, what is known about the TH1, the, about the TH1 which is the anti-IL-6 receptor antibodies, the IL-17 antibodies is that, that many, some of them are being evaluated, but many of the, many of the drugs are actually being discontinued in the clinical trials. Same in the case with small molecules as summaries provided here. What is interesting is that, that the, the PAN-JAC uh, small molecule which is tofacitinib uh, is marketed in rheumatoid arthritis but interestingly another JAK1, JAK2 specific uh, small molecule baricitinib has been approved 
only in Europe and rejected in USA because of serious safety issues. And also many of the other jack, uh, sm jack specific small molecules are kind of in phase 3 clinical trials, but some of them are essentially discontinued. The overall summary is this. The promise of anti-IL-17 and anti-IL-23 antibodies is actually low in rheumatoid arthritis indication. Uh, so one of the few interesting uh, targets, one is definitely GMCSF. Uh, GMCSF uh, is actually involved in uh, essentially activation of the formation of and differentiation of M1 macrophage and M1 macrophage again then cyclically produces GMCF, CSF and it can actually enhance the TH17 pathway because of which again the TH17 cells in a cyclical way can actually uh, activate formation of GMCSF and essentially it can cause uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines to be released and cells to be released for tissue inflammation and damage. And essentially this pathway has given a strong rationale to target GMCSF and interestingly there is an antibody which is called Mavrilimumab which is actually against the GMCSF receptor alpha. It has completed phase 2 trials and actually in a very controlled 24 week placebo study in 305 rheumatoid arthritis patients a biomarker evaluation was performed and Mavrilimumab treatment induced definitely significant down regulation of type 4 collagen formation marker and macrophage derived chemokines IL-2 receptor and IL-6 as compared with placebo. It also showed few things and the gene expression analysis indicated that macrophage and IL-2 and IL-17 significant signaling pathways are reduced. The myoid and T-cell associated transcript are also suppressed in responding patients but not in non-responders and the CCL-22 and IL-6 down regulation may reflect a direct effect, direct effect on production of pro-inflammatory mediators by myeloid cells and also the suppression of IL-2 receptor and IL-17 IL-22 associated transcripts possibly suggests an indirect effect on T-cell activation. So essentially there is a strong case for malvinumab and this has moved into phase 2 clinical trials and here they were actually able to see a significant improvement in the endpoints for rheumatoid arthritis and they also evaluated in another study they compared head on with another anti-TNF-alpha antibody and they were not able to show superiority of the drug of, uh, of, of this drug as compared to an anti-TNF-alpha antibody but essentially it was non-inferior. So overall this looks like a very interesting target which is moving forward into phase 3 clinical trials in rheumatoid arthritis. And then different small molecule uh, inhibitors are being evaluated but unfortunately it has just landed in failure. A classic example is uh, this drug called Spibrutinib which is against the Bruton tyrosine kinase. It's very similar to the JAK kinase and modulates, uh, modulates uh, T cell, uh, uh, modulates, uh, sorry, B cell function as well as macrophages and DC function and also what it does is that it's a, it also associated with macrophage signaling through the FC gamma receptor and in the absence of BTK, FC gamma receptor associated functions are in play because of which pro-inflammatory cytokines in macrophages in inhibitor, but unfortunately it exhibited lack of efficacy. On similar lines for rheumatoid arthritis, a host of drugs, antibodies which are, which are involved in controlling proliferation and differentiation of B cells and also MMP9 antagonist which is, which is involved in promoting rheumatoid synovial fibroblast survival, inflammation and cartilage degradation, a host of small molecules which are essentially involved in macrophage and T cell survival proliferation and differentiation just do not work. What is interesting here is that there is a very limited, uh, what do you call, uh, li limited set of drugs that are actually available which is now being developed with respect to rheumatoid arthritis after the excitement of the TH17 pathway inhibitors. So there is not much, I am not able to figure out in, in, in the research that's being done all over the world, any interesting targets which will make a huge difference in this particular, uh, what I call, in this particular inflammatory disease. Now I move on to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And here, uh, these are the set of biologics which are well known. I just want to focus uh, a bit on this particular molecule, which is not a biologic, interestingly. 
It's called Aplimon, and also all these biologics, the clinicians here are completely aware, Secucanumab, Exacizumab, which are anti-IL-17, they work very well. Then you have got Stikinumab, which is an anti-IL-12, IL-23. Alifacep is targeting T-cell at, at the, at really at the upstream. And also you've got a host of anti-TNF alpha antibodies, and then here also you have the um, you you have the yeah you have the anti-TNF alpha antibodies. So essentially, what really is the story here is that when it comes to biologics, there are no truly new biologics popping up with which are actually targeting new pathways in psoriasis as well as psoriatic arthritis. On similar lines, we have got apart from the jack kinase inhibitors. The P38 pathway inhibitor, the map, the these are all part of the MAP kinase pathway, and you've got the Aprilimus, Aprilimist, which is essentially a PD, PD4 inhibitor, which is already approved. And if you see the num, there's actually a paucity of drugs which can clearly work in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Essentially, there is a protein kinase C pathway inhibitor, also a small molecule, which is also being evaluated. But overall, what is interesting here is that the biggest breakthrough that has happened in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is the success of the anti-TL17, anti-TL17, anti-IL17 pathway molecules, but and also the anti-IL23, P19 subunit, and the P40 subunit. And also, if you notice carefully, interestingly, in psoriatic arthritis, the jack kinase inhibitors surprisingly are showing promise, but they are not showing any promise in psoriasis except for one. Uh, one, one drug which is tocacetinib. So overall, you can see a spectrum of differences in functional activity for these, for, these, uh, for these drugs with respect to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. The only interesting new molecules which I could kind of analyze from what is being, what is being published is this particular drug which is a monoclonal antibody called Nihulizumab which essentially targets CD162 which is also called the P-selecting glycoprotein ligand, which is expressed in activated T-cells. And what it does is that the inhibition of CD162 potently causes apoptosis of activated T-cells, and this is in phase two clinical trials in psoriasis. The other one is Aplimod. Aplimod is actually an oral small molecule, and it's a potent small molecule inhibitor of IL-12, IL-23. It has got a very novel function. Essentially, it binds to a PA3 kinase uh, type PA3 kinase, that is which, which is a, which is called PAK5, FYVE actually, and blocks its phosphotransferase activity leading to selective inhibition of IL-12 and IL-23 P40 subunit of this particular cytokine. So essentially, these are the only two molecules which look very promising and they entered phase two studies in psoriasis. They are not in psoriatic arthritis. On similar lines, if I look at the ankylosing spondylosis, nothing new has cropped up. It is the same set of molecules which include the anti-TNF alpha and you the anti-IL-17s which are in late stage development and but then there is only one JAK1 inhibitor which has been advanced into phase 2 studies but most of them are essentially discontinued or no activity is happening with respect to these molecules. Overall, there is no new drug which is right now being developed for ankylosing spondylitis unless otherwise there are some specific treatment options like using t or specific patient-specific dendritic cell therapies. Those are the only possibilities that exist for this particular indication. The biggest activity that is happening with new drugs is actually in inflammatory bowel disease. Essentially, you have, you have, uh, you have a big failure here, actually in inflammatory bowel disease with respect to the anti-IL-17 and the anti-IL-6. There is the ustekinumab, which is marketed, there is a promise for the anti-IL-23, but the anti-IL-17 uh, has not really worked. This molecule is being evaluated. Incidentally, anti-IL-17 molecules exacerbate the disease, and there's a problem of actually using anti-IL-17 molecules for inflammatory bowel disease, for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So on similar lines, you can see here that the JAK1 and the JAK2, uh, pan-JAK uh, small molecule, inhibitor is actually in phase 3 in ulcerative colitis, but many other drugs are not being developed and there is a JAK1 uh, inhibitor which is being developed in phase 3 for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So essentially here also you see that there is a slightly higher promise for the JAKs inhibitors as compared to the 
uh, monoclonal antibodies which target IL-17 pathway. But then there are a host of new, this is an extremely crowded slide, but I'll make it very simple. The quality of the slides is bad. I sincerely apologize. But essentially, what you have is the modulation of the T cells here, and there's a very interesting promise of leukocyte traffic, trafficking inhibition, and also the important specific anti integrin antibodies, which are very specific for the gut, uh, the, for the gut, because of the fact that there is one drug which is called natalizumab, which is approved for inflammatory, for inflammatory bowel disease, but also approved for multiple sclerosis. But it has got a problem of causing uh, PML because of the reactivation of the JC virus. So essentially, the new drugs, the next generation anti interlink drugs that are being developed are actually gut specific so that it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier and causes exacerbation of PML, which is a debilitating and fatal disease in multiple sclerosis patients. So the major activities are in these areas. Again, modification of T cell function. And B cell function is well known uh, in multiple sclerosis. It works wonderfully well. But surprisingly, in ulcerative colitis, there is no, not much research done on it, reducing B cell activity and trying to make it work. So essentially, there are some differences in B cell function. But then there's these, these molecules, they are small molecules which block the which block the actual uh, trafficking of leukocytes have also done well in clinical trials. But there's an interesting uh, antisense RNA molecule which blocks MAT7, which has also done very well in clinical trials. So this is a full summary of the same figure. Uh, what is there in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease which are being developed? Most of them are very, very familiar uh, molecules. You've got the JAKs. You've got the IL-23 and the IL-12, IL IL-23 antibodies. And then you've got this Mongerson. What is, ma ma what is highlighted in the red box is what I'm going to briefly discuss in the next slide. So essentially, what it means is this, that the, the new targets look to be the SMAT7 antisense RNA. Then you've got the whole lot of different um, anti-integrin antibodies, which are doing very well. And they've also got advanced into phase 3 clinical trials. And you've got Bedalizumab, which is an alpha-4 B7 integrin inhibitor, which is already approved. So overall, if you look at it, what are the interesting drugs in treatment of inflammatory bowel disease? One is Mongerson. This is essentially a SMAT7 inhibitor. And it's an anti antisense RNA, which is, because SMAT7 is actually a, uh, with an antagonist for TGF beta-1 expression. And essentially what it does is that this antisense RNA blocks max 7 function because of it, of beta 1 uh, is expressed more in the gut microenvironment. And it's a pleiotropic cytokine that's important for cell homeostasis. And it has got potent anti-inflammatory properties. This has done really well in clinical trials in both uh, Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis. And it's in phase 3 in Crohn's disease. Bedalizumab, as I mentioned earlier, is approved. It's a gut selective alpha 4 beta 7 integrin inhibitor. This drug, it, even if it crosses the blood brain barrier, it doesn't specifically block the, uh, the alpha 4 integrin, which is what is natalizumab's function, and that causes the PML uh, serious side effect. So essentially, what happens is that, that there is no risk of JC virus reactivation observed. Same in the case of Deprolizumab, which is actually an alpha 4 B7, alpha E B7 integrin inhibitor, and it blocks specific functions in the gut environment, specifically the alpha, B, alpha 4 B7 integrin MACCAM interaction and the alpha E B7 E cadmium interaction. And also, you've got an antibody which is against MACCAM, which it specifically targets MACCAM1 and blocks its ability to act as a ligand for integrin alpha B4, alpha B4 B7. So, what happens is this that in this in this in these different drugs the biggest promise is for the alpha 4 b7 the integrin drugs the macam one has not done so well in the clinical trial but still being pursued and there is this s1p1 uh, uh, agonist which actually results in re reduction in trafficking of leukocytes which actually has done very well in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis overall i just want to conclude that if you look at the new pathways of inflammation, the maximum number of drugs that are being developed is in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. There's very little activity and there are too many failures with respect to drugs for treating 
rheumatoid arthritis and there are no new drugs coming for ankylosing spondylosis and beyond the IL-17 pathway there are no great drugs for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis yet and that's how I would like to conclude this discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Well, the co-chair has a question and after that we can allow one question in the interest of time. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, in some cases, you say lack of efficacy. Yeah. Uh, have we gone back to find uh, and uh, investigated as to what are the possible reasons for lack of efficacy in some patients? Uh, it is uh, it's a it's a very valid question, and I don't have a correct answer for this. Honestly speaking, one of the reasons is that that uh, the I don't know whether the clinicians here can answer better than can, can I just answer, answer that? Yeah, I go think ahead. It's because most trials are looking at wrong outcomes. What you actually clinically feel is an outcome is not looked in the trial. Number one, for example, lupus trials, rituximab was a abysmal failure in trials, but works wonderfully in clinical practice. The reason is, it did not look at composite outcomes. It just looked at one aspect of lupus, and that's useless. So I think more and more, now you see trials in rheumatology, at least I'm sure Chandrasekhar sir will agree, we are moving towards composite endpoints which is actually which takes into disease activity which takes into physician assessment patient assessment quality of life so on and so forth so i think that is very very much the need of the hour so in that case uh, the success rates are quite high then if you change the outcome measures i mean if you modify the clinical outcome not really, not really. I'd like to kind of, uh, I agree with what Dr. Vijay Rao said, but what has happened is that I think the role of these different cytokines and the role of these different particular targets are not really understood across all the inflammatory diseases. That's what I strongly believe. For example, they went gaga about IL-17 for rheumatoid arthritis and it somehow it doesn't work. For example, the response in psoriatic arthritis as compared to psoriasis for the IL-17 inhibitors are pretty pretty different because you get complete clearance of the psoriatic lesions with IL-17 antibody, which was never the case with the TNF alpha inhibitors. But in the case of psoriatic arthritis, the response is not so dramatic. So I don't think we understood the context of these particular inflammatory mediators with respect to the context of the disease. Yeah. That's also yes, I feel, uh, but I, this is a very generic statement. Yes. I'm not good at this, so I don't think I'm the right person to yeah. answer. My this. basic thing was what Dr. Chandrasekhar addressed in the morning. Are there many inter-individual variations in responses to biosimilars? Uh, actually, uh, one of the point or issues is uh, none of the pharmaceutical industry, whatever they do the clinical trial, they don't publish the negative data. And uh, we don't have access to those negative data. Why did the fail? How many were successful? The, the second problem in all this research is uh, the, we, we, we really don't get the we, we don't really also get the information. See, for example, uh, FDA asked for a, at least a significant difference between the treated group and the control group. Yes. See, the problem is that when you are looking at a treated and a control group, uh, none of them cross a uh, say if it doesn't cross 30-40%, but we have forget a very interesting point that 30% of the patient had responded yes. despite uh, comparing it to the placebo or any other conditions. Right. So those terms are making a lot of problems yeah. here. So just to give a best example is the anti rankle antibody which could really heal the erosions but was never approved for rheumatoid arthritis. It's not approved for rheumatoid arthritis treatment. Yeah. So best would be to identify who are the responders. I think that would make it more meaningful to define the indications. Uh, the uh, previous uh, topic of uh, the drug target, the map, the, the exactly. picture which you showed, it all showed to me that they are all interlinked. The diseases are interlinked, the gene expression is interlinked and the targets are also interlinked. So uh, I think that's why that should answer more. So, i just add on to what you guys said. Uh, one of the most, I can't name the two companies which ran the same uh, similar trial for a disease. Same target, same monoclonal antibodies, one succeeded, one did not. Postmortem reports what, meaning postmortem of the companies, uh, share loss, that's what I meant by postmortem. Said, the cohort of patients selected for a clinical trial between these two companies, or the two trials were different. One. Uh, Adding on to the composite uh, readouts is absolutely important. 
The second one was one had a purer subpopulation which went into the trial. The other company just went in for the widespread multi-stage uh, part of the disease. So the outcome is definitely, in addition to what you said, it is influenced by composite outcome, by patient selection. That is for sure that goes on. And with system biology, I think you can show, you can choose a trial to pass or fail because you can stratify the patients even before you even try it out. And the comment and question which I would want you to uh, uh, share is, uh, since you're from the industry, what's happening to the t reg inducers? Abbott came across uh, two years ago saying that they have a t reg inducer small molecule for autoimmune conditions. So you're talking about the... I talk about the road gamma T inhibitors? No. No, no. It was an inducer. It was a natural T reg inducer. That's what they classified. It came in the nature review drug discovery. I'm, I'm not knowledgeable. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, see, I want, I want to make a comment on what you're talking about. What's, I just want to understand whether that particular molecule you're talking about or the target you're talking about was in oncology or was in autoimmune disease? Uh, oncology. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. So, yeah, that's not oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I think what has happened is now the latest results that has come from the same study, and you know, uh, the yeah, the share price crashed, all those things, yeah. let it be. But the important point is that the latest results which has come again after the phase 3 study, it has come back, and essentially I think they have got approved. Yeah. Even though what happened is that the other company moved forward faster yeah. because of it, they got a priority in the market. But the basic, basic point is system biology informed patient selection for precision medicine. No, but you know, I have, I have, that's the reason I was asking the question to Dr. Chandra about broader man. I have a problem there about the system biology, and we can debate this possibly later. The biggest problem for me, I still don't have an answer. Uh, if you try to do a system biology approach as a, you know, you know what you call a, uh, what you call a informed. No, informed means what I'm trying to say is the predefined acceptance criteria to start something. There is still a surprise because of the fact that Rodolumab is a classic example where they thought that the same target would work in every indication but Rodolumab did not work but binding to the same target it actually exacerbated the disease so I don't understand all these things really well so even if you categorize with the predefined acceptance criteria with this kind of information you need to do all your functional assays very efficiently before you decide how to take it forward in a patient population not so much a problem in systems biology, it's a problem in incomplete information reported to the network. Uh, no, that information was available for that company. But I listened to their talk because the, the person who ran the clinical trial came and presented in our company and they were they showed very similar slides, what you had shown. So they did a systems biology approach, but they were completely taken aback when it failed in their animal models for yeah, I must add that systems biology is not a homogeneous entity at all. The same data, same kind of analysis, people can do very different. No, I also want to clarify that this could be an exception to the rule. So let me be honest here. No, no, no. See, see the, the basic problem is the uh, failure of any prediction is because you are not considered every point appropriately. See, it, it's, it's just like how I choose a patient. If I choose a bad patient with a wrong prediction, I land up in a mess. Uh, that's all what it happens. I think in the interest of time, we'll move forward. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, really.